reload your three-bladed sword, get comfortable in your studded leather kirtle or your chainmail bikini, fire up the wizard van, it's about to get weird. Welcome to Swords Against Madness, my personal fusion of solo, old-school role-playing game and weird fiction storytelling. I'm playing Swords and Wizardry, a modern retelling of the 1974 through 1977 original rules to Dungeons & Dragons, mixed with a few solo gaming tools like the Mythic Game Master emulator. First I play the game, and then I turn it into a psychedelic story for your enjoyment. There are no special rules here to protect the characters. No fudging and no rerolls. These dungeons could get deadly pretty fast. But I'll try and keep it what passed for PG back when I was a kid in the 1980s. If you didn't hear it on Goonies, Gremlins, or Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you won't hear it here. Now get ready to party like it's 1974 with Swords Against Madness. The giant yellow centipede's mandibles glistened with venom that dripped down on Rhea's armor, hissing as it landed. It opened up the scythe-like mandibles, and its head descended like the blade of a guillotine, only to be deflected at the last moment by a desperate blow from Olan. Steel clattered against Chitin ineffectively, even as he wrestled with the one that was attempting to get its hundreds of legs wrapped around him. Rhea snarled in frustration, trying to push the weight of the oversized arthropod off of her. But it was no use. No matter what she did, it had too many limbs and was too powerful. She watched with anger and regret as her light flashed before her eyes. And then came the disturbing aroma, the strange colors, the weird feeling in her head, as Miria unleashed the warp she had stored in her body. A pulse of mind-bending energy washed over her, over the centipedes, and she lost consciousness. Myria took a moment to let out a ragged breath that she hadn't been aware that she was holding. It was over. Both the monsters and her companions were asleep. She drew that strange, beautiful magical dagger and began punching holes through the brains of the arthropods before shaking Olan and Rhea awake. She said nothing. She didn't need to. It was done. And at least for now, they were safe. Welcome to Chapter 5 of Swords Against Madness. In our last chapter, Miria, Rhea, and Olan returned from Kalmak's manor with the magic dagger and proceeded to execute the Gorum the immortal space barbarians that had been burning and pillaging the small village of Nar, where Olan and Rhea come from. Once the grim work was done, Miria tried meditating on the beach, and found strange comfort in the company of a psionic squid, before she received a calm call from Yangyu, an old contact in the Trasi Syndicate, who called to mock her and threaten her, amused that she had survived the crash, and worried that she might be meddling with his merchandise. Frustrated and ready to move on, Miria gathered Rhea and Olan and headed into the jungle. Along the way, she had to find a little bit of humility and began to finally bond with her two new companions. That is, until the party ran into a group of human-sized centipedes roaming through the jungle looking for a new home. That last battle was pretty hairy. I rolled that the party ran into man-sized centipedes while they were on their way to the Tower of the Celestial Order, and that the centipedes had the drop on them. Thankfully, the encounter began so far away that the centipedes used up that round of surprise closing in with the party. They managed to reach Rhea and Olan, but didn't manage to actually land a hit him. On the next round, the party had initiative. Olan and Rhea both failed to do any damage to the centipedes. In fact, Rhea, for the umpteenth time, rolled a natural one and lost her blade. But Miria had sleep prepared, and so she simply bombed the area, knocking out friend and foe alike, and then was able to deliver a few coups de grace to the centipedes before waking her allies. All of which played out in less than six rolls of the dice. But that is one of the things I love about old-school gaming. So much can happen with so little. 
especially if you're willing to take just a few creative liberties with how you describe what happened after the dice have fallen and you've interpreted the results. Seven years ago, in the village of Nar, Rhea crouched and hugged her knees as she hid underneath the stairs, listening to her parents fret and argue one more time. Look, I don't like it any more than you, her mother said. But the fact is that we have to think about her future, and the church, at least they give her one. You've seen what happens when cousins marry. You know what it's like. Think about Elman's boy down the road. Do you want our grandchild to be like that? Enough. I don't want to hear it. Her father's tankard crashed heavily down on the table. I'm not going to force her to do anything she doesn't want. I'm not talking about forcing her. I'm talking about opening up some opportunities, letting her meet some men. Men who aren't her cousins. Like everyone is on this island. I want her to be able to marry... Fine, fine, but I'm not going to arrange anything for Rhea. She's her own person, not our puppet. Bring someone by tomorrow, and I'll be watching just as hard as she is about how this works out. Rhea loved her father. He drank a little too much. He cursed a little too much. But if there was one thing that was absolutely true about him, he wanted her to make her own way. She thanked him quietly in a whisper and a prayer and then waited for them to wander off to bed before she crept back into her own. The next morning, her mother had brushed her and dressed her as best she could, fighting the eternal war against Rhea's unruly curly hair and doing her best to work subtle makeup to make her eyes seem less like they are popping out of her head. Her father spent the day sitting in the corner, sour-faced with his arms folded across his chest, as he listened to visiting missionaries and preachers talk about the benefits of joining the church, about the contacts they would make both here and abroad back in the homeland. Nobody born in Nar had any idea what it was like to have a home in the Aldean guilds. Then after a few hours came the main event. They introduced Rhea to Edrin, a man twice her age, balding, overweight, and while he was neatly groomed and wore finery all over his person, the moment he sat across from her, face to face, she nearly gagged on the smell of whiskey lingering about him. Hello, miss, he started. I'm very pleased to meet you. I want to talk to you in particular about how the church can take care of you and me. See, I don't know anyone here in Nar, not at all. But back home I'm a wealthy man, and I've got three ships to my name. Soon to be a fourth. Maybe I should name it the Rhea. What do you think? It is such a pretty name after all. His hand rested on her knee, and Rhea fought the urge to gag on the smell of alcohol lingering over the fat man. His fingers left streaks of sweat across her leggings. I'd love to get acquainted with the island, make local corrections. I also am looking for a wife. Some smart girl. I say you're a smart girl. Who can help me take care of some figures and some sums. I'd make sure you'd live like a princess here. Beautiful house. Not much work. I can afford servants. All you'd have to give me are a few sons to help me pass on the business. At this, his hands were already creeping up her inner thigh. She squirmed, her head reeling, starting to feel boozy from breathing the same air as the man. And then she couldn't take it anymore. She balled a fist and shot it straight at his groin. He let out a howl of pain as he doubled over. Then she grabbed him by the ear and threw him to the floor with one swift motion. If this is what the church wants from me, they can find someone else. Maybe a prize pig. She kicked him once for good measure, then stormed out. She couldn't help but notice as she went that her father was trying to stifle a smile. Do you 
enjoy old school RPGs? Do you love stories of sword and sorcery? Are you tired of the typical actual plays and long unedited podcasts? Then look no further than Legends from the Fireside, a hybrid storytelling RPG podcast. A podcast filled with tales of adventure and heroism, all at the mercy of the roll of the dice. There's no telling where the story will go and where we will end up. No life is sacred and no one's survival is guaranteed. You can find the show on all major podcast platforms and we hope you enjoy Legends from the Fireside. The tension was gone now. Olan, Rhea, and Miria walked together with ease and comfort with each other. The beautiful, supernatural combination of gratitude and humility worked together to erase the discomfort they felt with Miria earlier in the day. Now Olan and Rhea were excited to tell her about the Order of the Stars and the history of the island. They walked together, pushing their way through the underbrush, a little more cautious now, perhaps. Olan kept his eyes out as he picked out the markers to take them to the hidden tower. He tried his best to tell Miria what to expect, but it was awfully hard to figure that out. After all, no one had come to fulfill a prophecy here before. Ultimately, they fell back on funny stories and local gossip, just trying to get her a feel for the community that she was now a hero to. Not once during all of that talk, however, did Olan let his attention stray. Had any of the jungle's other threats, more centipedes, the giant ravening caterpillars, the white apes that sometimes terrorize the mountaintops. He would have seen them coming. Unfortunately, he was not looking for men. He didn't notice the distant, ragged breathing, the soft steps, the sound of a man putting down soft boots where they had just trod down the undergrowth themselves, the faint sound of teeth grinding angrily as Kalmek followed them from a safe distance one hand resting on the hilt of a sword. His eyes burned holes in the back of Rhea, but she didn't notice. He wanted to make her pay worst of all. His face was still purple in a number of places and coated in plasters where she had managed to grind him hardest into the gravel. Oh, he wanted a piece of her, and there were brothers in the church who would thank him for doing it. But of course, Miria had to be his first target. That was made easier as he observed his grandfather's precious dagger hanging off of her belt like a common pocket knife. Did that woman even understand what she was dealing with? If she really was from another world, did they have the kind of magic that could make a dagger like that? He didn't know. He certainly knew that she had no right to be carrying it. And he was going to get it back. The Mythic Game Master emulator has a fantastic way of keeping me from being boring. After the centipede battle, I wanted to play out a scene where Olan and Rhea become true friends with Miria, where they all start to bond after this incredibly perilous moment. But when I asked the Mythic Game Master emulator if it was going to go according to plan, it had other ideas. Namely, it ruled that there was an NPC action going on. And when I rolled Who off of my little table of NPCs I've created so far, it told me that Kalmek was up to something. What? I asked the Game Master emulator. And I got Spy Travel. Well, obviously Kalmek is already stalking them, and he has ideas of what he wants to do next. This is fantastic, because now I have this ticking time bomb. An angry, armed NPC with a couple of levels and fighter looking for a chance to take back what is his and get a little payback. Maybe a lot of payback. And the Game Master emulator didn't stop there. When I finally moved on and prepared a scene where they arrived at the hidden tower, I got another interrupt. When I asked what it was, I got NPC action again. But this time, it was the priests in the temple. What were they doing? Well, I got the rather cryptic carry reality. But then I realized that 
they had desperately invested themselves, I had said so myself, in proving that the Order of the Stars was wrong. They wanted to be the only ones in charge of who got to say what was real and what was not. And they certainly weren't about to let Miria reinforce the local superstitions, as they would put it. So what were they up to? I asked a few questions, and what I got was that they had hired a mercenary to block their path. Not just a faithful church member, but someone truly vicious, mean, and calculating. And his mandate? Make sure that Rhea doesn't reach that temple. Do whatever it takes. Hours of heat, sweat, clinging vines and pushing. They were all aching and tired by the time they emerged into the clearing where the path to the tower began. The building itself was only visible just barely. Green stained marble through the forest canopy some distance ahead. The path was lined by bollards of metal with crystal domes on them showing various configurations of stars. Miria recognized these as old navigation terminals someone had turned into path lights. She almost had to laugh, but decided not to, so as not to disappoint Olan. As they pressed ahead, she got the clear sensation that they were being watched. If Miria had been more sensitive, she might have felt the spell being quietly intoned behind them. Although even if she could, she probably couldn't tell how the spell was working as it slowly seeped into the mind of Rhea beside her, bending and breaking her will without so much as a sound. By the time the man stepped out onto the path, holding a staff out in front of him, Rhea's mind was already captive. He smiled and nodded to her. Cousin Mormont, I'm so glad to see you. I wish I could say the same, Rhea, he said. But I'm afraid I'm here to say that you may go no further. The Order of the Stars has reviewed what we have heard, what we have been told by Otho about the coming of Miria. We have observed her fallen craft and listened to what she has said, and determined her words to be false and heresy. She is not welcome here, and may not proceed up the path. What? This can't be right. Olan took a couple of steps forward and found Rhea resting a hand on his shoulder. Mormont, I haven't talked to you in ages. When was the last time you were even in the tower? That doesn't matter now, does it? I am speaking for them, am I not? How do I even... Peace, Olan. Maybe we should listen to what he has to say. Maybe we should turn back. I've come to care about Miria, but it's pretty clear she isn't who we were expecting to come to us. Miria set her jaw. I've come a long way, and if these magicians in the tower don't want me here, they can say it at the gate, not head me off at the pass. Don't you think that's a little suspicious? Olan took a step forward. I do think that's suspicious, yes. What do you have to say, Mormont? Why are you alone? I appreciate what you're saying, Olan. I understand why you would be suspicious. But I will say this, if you interfere with this, if you prevent me from turning Miria away, you could be excommunicated. Surely you don't want that, do you? I am of deadly seriousness. The heresies of Miria can go no further. She is welcome to stay in the village of Nar until a ship can take her away, but that is all. I don't believe you. I don't believe this. I'm not turning around. Miria attempted to push past Mormont. He leveled his staff with the ground and placed it in front of her, barring her passage. Miria reached down, grabbed hold of his staff, yanked it out of his hands, and flung it into the forest. I'd like to see you stop me. Very well, then, if that's the way you want it. A knife appeared in his hand out of seemingly nowhere, kept hidden up a sleeve. Miria stepped back as he made his first grab for her. She backpedaled, wide-eyed, staring at the knife, her chest rising and falling. She didn't have any magic at her disposal, 
Was the blade on her belt good enough for this? Was she good enough with the blade? Olan took a couple of steps forward, intending to intercede, but Rhea was in front of him, her arms spread wide. I can't let you do it, Olan. Not with all the order means to you. Don't throw it away. Rhea, what's gotten into you? This isn't like you at all. Miria took one slash with the blade. It leapt into her hand so swiftly she didn't even realize that she had grabbed hold of it. She was a bit confused. She had intended on grabbing a branch so that she could get better distance. It didn't matter. Mormont was the better fighter. He grabbed hold of her wrist and twisted hard. The next thing she knew, his knife was at her throat. That'll be enough of that. Now you're coming with me. Olan broke hard around Rhea, trying to get hold of Mormont, only to find that he too was quickly grabbed as Rhea twisted his arm behind his back and brought him to his knees, at least long enough to get him into a lock that he couldn't get out of. Olan, this is for your own good, she said, nodding to Mormont, who smiled a wan, sickly smile. Come, let me explain to you what's going to happen next at a little special place I keep just for myself. Thank you so much for listening to Swords Against Madness, Episode 5. Swords Against Madness has been GM'd, played, written, and directed by Brian C. Rideout. And I've done all the voices for this episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear a little more, or get information on characters, magic items, spells, and other custom content, visit my homepage at Swords the madness dot stormhead productions dot ca i love hearing from fans of the show if you want to reach me find me on x where i am at swords v madness and if you want to talk all things role-playing games check out my blog death trap games dot blogspot dot com finally there's nothing i love more than talking shop about podcasting you can contact me through my coaching and production company Stormhead Productions at Stormhead Audio on X or StormheadProductions.ca. I'd love to hear from you and I'm happy to help you out. Believe me, when it comes to podcasts, I can talk shop all day long. The music for Swords Against Madness was generated by Brian C. Rideout using the Suno AI. And this episode contains sound effects from Pixabay. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, play hard, roll high, and think weird.